when I was 11 years old, my friend's church held a series of revival meetings for children. Every evening for a week, I listened from the front pew as an enthusiastic guest preacher invited me and my school classmates to dedicate our whole hearts, lives, dreams, and futures to God. In no uncertain terms, he told us that God wanted us to give up everything for the one who gave up everything for us, and to use our talents and treasures, not to further our own interests, but to spread Christ's message of love and salvation to the world. I remember feeling exhilarated as I sat in church that week, imagining the radical, sold-out-for-Jesus life the preacher described. But I also remember feeling apprehensive and disoriented. Whether or not the minister intended it, what I took away from his sermons was that I couldn't serve Jesus properly unless I became someone fundamentally different from who I was. My shyness and introversion would have to give way to voluble charisma and flame. I'd have to say goodbye to the United States and head to some far-flung corner of the world I've never heard of. I'd have to become a pro face-to-face and door-to-door evangelism. I'd have to surrender my dreams of, at the time, athletic training and become useful. In this version of discipleship I conjured up as a kid, my value in God's kingdom existed in inverse proportion to my innate loves, interests, desires, and hopes. The only authentic way to follow Jesus was to somehow become not me. In our Gospel reading this week, Jesus approaches two sets of fishermen by the Sea of Galilee and says to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, Matthew's Gospel tells us the men left their boats and followed Jesus. I'll be honest, I enjoy fishing. When I was a little girl, my father would take me along on fishing trips, and I loved it. One time, though, I invited one of my friends and they didn't take to it like I did. Isn't that hook hurting the war? Won't the fish mouth get cut by the hook? Why are you letting that poor fish gasp in the bucket? It's still alive. Hard as she tried to enjoy the sunlight on the water, the cool ocean breeze, the satisfaction of a good catch, she couldn't get over what she saw as the essential violence at the heart of fishing. A living creature offered up as bait, Another living creature, torn by a sharp poker, hauled out of its native element with a net and left to die for lack of air. Eventually, I stopped inviting her on fishing trips. (laughs) But in remembering that experience with my friend, I can see how some people don't easily connect to Jesus' invitation to fish for people. Something about the metaphor makes some squirm. And it doesn't help that often when this story is told, it is framed as an evangelistic in a particular sense. The fish represents lost souls doomed to hellfire, hooking them for Jesus, getting them to church, youth group, to the altar, leading them to say the sinner's prayer and accept Jesus as their personal Savior, insisting that only one version of Christianity held the truth, which would save them from damnation. It was the only hope poor fish have. So, knowing all this, was I ready, as that revival preacher told my 11-year-old self, to give up everything, leave all I know and love and follow Jesus? Was I willing to fish for lost souls? Or would I cling to my worldly boats and nets, ignore Jesus' call, and let countless sinners die without salvation? Gospel stories are challenging to grasp, even at the best of times. But years of baggage can make that task even harder. But what strikes me now as I think about Jesus' calling, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, into lives of discipleship, is how familiar and close to home his call actually was. Jesus did not invite them to abandon who they were. He invited them to become their most authentic, God-ordained selves. He invited them to live into the fullness of the Imago Dei, the reborn. By which I mean, 
Jesus' invitation to his first disciples were specific and particular, rooted in the language, culture, and vocation they knew best. What metaphor would make more sense to four fishermen than the metaphor of fishing for people? Simon and Andrew would have understood the nuances of that metaphor in ways we never will. James and John knew from years of hard-won hard experience what depths of patience, resilience, intuition, and artistry professional fishing required. These men knew the tools of the trade, the limitations of their bodies, and the potential dangers those limitations posed, and the life and death importance of timing, humility, and discretion. Most of all, they knew the walk. They knew how to respect it, how to listen to it, and how to bring forth its best in due time. When Jesus called these tried and true fishermen to follow, they understood the call to not a directive to leave their experience and intelligence behind, but to bring the best of their core selves forward, to become even more fully and freely themselves. In other words, I don't believe that I'm meant to follow Jesus into a self-annihilating abstract. We're not supposed to heed his call in general, as if Christianity comes in a number of prepackaged, cookie-cutter shapes we have to pummel ourselves into. If we're going to follow him at all, we'll have to do it in the unique particulars of the lives, communities, cultures, families, and vocations we find ourselves in. We'll have to put or we'll have to trust that God prizes our intellects, our memories, our backgrounds, our educations, and our skills, and that he will multiply, shape, and bring to fruition everything we offer up to him in faith and the daily stuff of our lives. I will make you, he tells the fisherman. I will take, cultivate, deepen, magnify, purify, protect, and perfect the people God created you to be. I don't mean to suggest that discipleship won't require sacrifice or change or risk. It will. But I am convinced these days that God is gentler with us than we are with ourselves. The spiritual transformations that we have had the most traction, or the spiritual transformation that have had the most traction and power in my life have been the ones that feel the most organic, the most ordinary the most close to home. Surrender to Jesus isn't only about renunciation. It's also about resurrection. It's about abundant and authentic life. When Jesus promises to make us, it's a commitment to nurture us, not a threat to sever us from all we love. It's a promise rooted in gentleness and respect, not violence and coercion. It's a promise that when we dare to let go, the things we relinquish might be returned to us anew, enlivened in ways we couldn't have imagined on our own. Most importantly, it is a promise from God to us, not from God, or not from us to God. As Barbara Brown Taylor so aptly puts it, the story of this gospel is a miracle story. Jesus calls and the four fishermen immediately follow. No hesitation. No questions asked. Is this because they're men of superhuman courage or prophetic foreknowledge? Of course not. These are the same guys who later in the Gospels doubt, deny, and abandon Jesus. They're as fallible and as ordinary as the rest of us, and their own volition can't get them very far. No, they immediately follow Jesus because Jesus makes it possible for them to do so. This is not a story about us, Taylor writes. It's a story about God, and about God's ability not only to call us, but also to create us as people who are able to follow. Able to follow because we cannot take our eyes off the one who calls us, because he interests us more than anything else in our lives, because he seems to know what we hunger for, because he seems to be the food. What bothered me, as a child, and still bothers me, about the fishing metaphor is that we so easily misinterpret it to mean that we have the power to hook 
or catch others for God. We don't. We are not called to cajole, manipulate, trap, bully, or even persuade others to accept Jesus or to join our religion. It is God alone who captures the imagination. God alone who makes the vision of his kingdom come alive in the human soul. All we can do is embody the vision and the particulars of our lives, reflecting into the water the profound beauty of who Christ is. The rest is up to God. In the end, Jesus' invitation is gospel, or good news. If it's not good news, it's not God. If it's not good news for all, it's not God. Evangelism becomes abusive when we twist it for our own convenience, severing it from its social, economic, and cultural context in order to institutionalize and idolize what is not God. It becomes abusive when we focus on numbers, formulas, and glossy success stories, forgetting that Jesus came to call people, fish for people, people who are caught in the nets of exploitation, corruption, poverty, war, exile, homelessness, violence, disease, climate change, racism, sexism, homophobia, and the list goes on and on and on. What would count as good news for them? The four men immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. In time, they made the gospel their own, sharing its radical power through the details of their own lives and stories. What is the gospel according to you? What is your good news? And how will you share it in the turbulent waters of your particular time and place? Follow me and I will make you. Jesus is trusting you. You will. Amen. You will notice I am family list today. Uh, the kids are with their dad, but uh, the older three have a derby bout at Western Escapement that is going on right now. <laughs> so they're all over their life. Uh, so that's why I'm single today. Um, big announcement is annual meeting is today. Thank you for everybody who has come. We are going to have a uh, kitchen and an agenda and all fun stuff. Any other announcements? <laughs> awesome. Well, that was easy. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Cool. All right. Ascribe to the Lord the honor in His name. Bring offering, come in. To